the chair over to Ms. Sandy Schlesinger, the Vice President of the Northwest West Lower Michigan Synod, for the Bishop's Report. Thank you, Bishop. And so I am just so honored uh, to have the last year uh, partner that, that amount of time, actually not a year, probably eight months, six, six to eight months, because he started September 1st officially, um, to partner with Bishop Craig Satterley. He is just high energy. He was is loving the position of Bishop. I think he just is eager to do this ministry, and we can tell that by, by his presence of out and about among us. And so I look forward, and, and I am so honored to introduce you and to hand over the mic to you so you can give us your report. Thank you. Uh, my, you have my written report on pages 20 to 31 in the assembly book. Um, I did make just a few amend, amend, am, am, amendments to the, uh, the part that is the roster leaders report. And I think we're going to bring that up on the slide. First, Pastor Justin Walker was ordained and installed in 2012. Second, uh, Pastor Ronald Bessert, who, who is in the process of transferring out of our synod, uh, the way the process works that we're learning, the synod council needs to release him and we need to take that vote. Finally, I am pleased to add under calls accepted, Pastor Roseanne Anderson was called to St. John's in Lake City. Pastor Shearston Priddy was installed, or was called to Trinity in Battle Creek. And Pastor Laura Kuntz was called to Calvary and uh, St. Stephen in Lansing. So those uh, are the amendments to my report. Um, rather than read you the report, what I'd like to do is to talk to you about what I've learned in my first year as bishop. So from the seven days of Genesis to the seven seals of Revelation, scripture is saturated with the number seven. Essentially, all biblical scholars, regardless of their strife, recognize the number seven spiritual significance as a symbol of fullness, completion, and perfection. So what I would like to do is share with you seven things that I learned in my first year as mission. First, God does powerful things in and through what we do when we worship. God does powerful things in and through what we do when we worship. I saw it in some instances that were important to me in my own installation when hands were laid on my head and the cross was placed around my neck in the faces of Sarah and David um, at their installations they're really, when we say this office is commended to you there really is a profound acceptance um when I ordained Sarah Consul at Trinity Seminary, when I washed feet uh, in, at New Life in Spruce, led uh, three chrism masses where we blessed the oil and I prayed over our roster leaders. But mostly I see God doing powerful things as I am at the table distributing communion. Um, what I have heard from people throughout our synod is, yes, it's great if you preach, Bishop, but we'd like you to distribute communion. Uh, my friend Bernie Philobam, who was my teacher, uh, said at a conference uh, retreat um, in September that there's no more important thing than to distribute the bread and say the body of Christ given for you. And as in so many things, Bernie is right. So I thank you for that privilege. Second, my, Phil Haugen, the retired bishop in southeastern Iowa, who is one of my conversation partners and counselors, advised me that the bishop, the office of the bishop, is too big for one person. The office of the bishop is too big for one person, and he is right. So I am very grateful for the people with whom I share it. And we're going to introduce them now. You're going to come up or? Yep. All right. 
So seeing I can't see what order you're in, we'll line up and I will ask you to step forward. Is that all right? Very good. Step forward. Oh, yeah. yeah, just step forward. So Margie Bauer is our financial administrator who has been with us since 1997. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Rebecca Rossum Bossenbrook is um, in her present role as the Lane Ministry Training Program Administrator, and she has served in that role since 2013. <laughs> <laughs> Such an enthusiastic girl. Yes. And Sister Nancy Verso OP is, I love that she's a Dominican, that's the Order of Preachers is the facilitator of Living Fire Ministries and now serves also as advisor to the bishop for spiritual formation. And she has been in that role for five years. Yay! It's great. Okay. And Ann Stavros, who uh, technical title is administrative assistant, but in the last two months has been chief cook and bottle washer. Yep. <laughs> And then there's the newbies. <laughs> Pastor Sarah Friesenkar, for assistant to the Bishop for Congregation and Leadership Excellence, has been with us since October. Yeah. Pastor David Sprang, assistant to the Bishop and Director of Evangelical Mission, has been with us since January. Pastor Alec Laura Kuntz, who is our part time sin coordinator, has been with us for eight weeks. We don't know where she is. She is okay. Janice Jensen, our assembly coordinator has been with us for five weeks. <laughs> and Kathy Sanderley, the driver to the bishop, has been with us since September 1st. Yes. I am going to just say a word about the driver to the bishop. <laughs> And uh, she has her sidekick with her, I'm sure, uh, Chelsea Satterley, who just graduated from the University of Michigan. I'm counting how much time I will have with my daughter as she grows up. So I'm glad you're here. Uh, I really am the envy of the, the 66 bishops of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America because I have a driver. <laughs> and I will tell you, um, there are days when you get in the car after a meeting and bishops tell me they need to go find a parking lot and sit. Um, it, it's an emotional week for the bishops because Bruce Burnside, um, who was in an accident that resulted in a death a year ago, pled guilty this week. Um, so thank you for my time. Very, very much. We go to conference of bishops meetings and the bishops' spouses all go, I never see my husband! And Kathy says, I'd like that! <laughs> Our deans really do serve as adjunct synod staff, and so I'd like to invite them to stand as their names are called. Pastor Christine, Christina Bright from the Sunrise Conference. <laughs> Pastor Justin Grimm from the Travers Conference. <laughs> Pastor Bill Puther from the Jack Pine Conference. Pastor Kerry Foss from the Kalamazoo Conference. <laughs> Pastor Doug Ogden from the Stony Lake Conference. <laughs> Pastor Dan Stoneck from the Bay Area Conference. <laughs> Pastor Scott Switz from the, from the Greater Grand Rapids Conference. Pastor Matt Titus from the Capital Area Conference. I have said that um, I, when I spoke to Sandy that uh, she has been a partner and she really has. I am really grateful for the Synod Council. Uh, they are partners and leaders and guides and questioners and idea makers. And they're a little nervous because I've said, what do you mean we don't get to meet again until September? So the, I find the meeting so valuable. So I am grateful to our Synod Council. I am grateful to our Bishop Emeriti, uh, who are there for um, 
advice and counsel when I need it. Um, and finally, there are some people that are members of our synod that are invisible or unnamed assistants to the bishop and have asked that they remain that way. <laughs> and I thank them. The office of the bishop is too big for one person. And I am grateful to be surrounded with so many leaders with whom to share it. Third, becoming bishop, they say, is like drinking water from a fire hose. <laughs> the closest I can compare it to is my first, su first semester in graduate school, where you not, even, not only need to do the work and perform, you need to learn how to do the work and perform. And we do this in a time of the church when the church is like trying to re redesign an airplane in mid-flight. So things are taking longer than I'd have ever imagined. Um, we do and we try and we redo, and we'll keep redoing and trying and redoing. So I thank you for your patience. I'm technology task force, great idea. I suggested it at the September meeting, and I figured we'd have it done by January. <laughs> Getting a staff in place, that should take two months, right? So we really have spent this year in a transition of setting the foundation for the things we want to do. Four, the placement and the support of both professional and volunteer leaders is central and foundational to the mission of this church. And I want to say that again. The placement and support of both professional and volunteer leaders is central and foundational to the mission of this church. Putting the right pastor in place, the right rostered leader in place, is really about the mission of Christ's church. Empowering lay leaders to be leaders is about the mission of the church. So we take the call process very, very seriously. It is a prayerful, purposeful, patient process which means it doesn't happen as fast as people would like. In this time of the church's life, there are less pastors. So first call pastors, we were able to get 60, across the church, there were 60% of the first call pastors um, that were needed. So 40% of the first call congregations across the ELCA that need a seminary graduate will not get one. They're just not there. Okay? So, and, and as, as it moves on, um, pastors with what you might call executive experience, they are harder and harder to come by. So the call process is slow. Uh, congregations, and I mean this very seriously, need to have and be able to articulate a mission. So when I say to a congregation, what should I say to a pastor about why they should come here? They say, we're a loving family. <laughs> the problem is the pastor isn't a loving family. His church, her church, right? Mm -hmm. So what is your one-liner? That, that you know you can and there's your sense of mission because if you can say it to a pastor you can say it to a neighbor right so um, Lutherans I'm saying more and more we don't agree on anything except this there's no better place to hear the unconditional love of God and to experience it in the sacraments what's your one line our pastors need to be clear and articulate about who they are and about their sense of mission. So it's really interesting. There was a post on the clergy page on Facebook, ELCA clergy page, in which one of the bishops suggested that pastors like proofread their forms so there aren't misspellings and typos when congregations read them. This seems logical to me. Pastors were offended. <laughs> Pastors need to be clear and articulate. The it's, it's, about, it's about the relationship, but it's the paperwork that gets pastors in the room. So we all need to take the call process, the staffing process, seriously as foundational to the mission of this church. 
We want, we want, one of my visions is that this synod be a place of continuing education and support for rostered and lay leaders. We have a foundation laid in the lay ministry program uh, through a grant from Trinity and Bent, Trinity and Bent? No, St. Peter's in Battle Creek. Um, we have found we have founded a, mini, a program called uh, Living Word Ministry, where I am able to give continuing education away for free. Uh, we you just, pastors just need to leaders need to just get there. For 15 years, they flew me around the country to teach and paid me big bucks. Ha ha. <laughs> but I can do it here for free, and eventually I have enough pals that I can say, "Come and see Trevor City and give a lecture, and we'll make that work." We are moving, uh, Sandy and I are moving toward finding opportunities and ways to, um, to train council leaders. So watch for that. That is coming. Fifth, we are a church in mission. We are doing a lot. One of the things that I have to do as budget, as bishop, is sign every check. I am amazed how much money this synod gives away. We give 50% to the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the church-wide expression. But I sign a lot of other checks for things like LSSM, for campus ministry, for grants to congregations. We support a lot of mission, global companionships. So um, I'm pretty pleased and proud of that and you should be too. I think we need to do a better job of sharing with each other the mission that we are doing, uh, the stories that we have. Uh, one of the questions that, that I'm going to find out in the coming year is how many people do the congregations of this synod feed in a week? I'd like to, I will tell you that next year. I think we will be blown away. Um, and where are we going in mission? One of this, the, the, the tasks that the city council has given me to do is to do some listening, and so I am doing listening. Um, I hope to bring you a report, but I have two hunches. Want to hear my hunches? Yeah. One, we just dedicated the building at, at Advent in Lake Anne. It is time for us to build another church. Secondly, and this one makes me nervous, I think we are going to prison. <laughs> as, I have traveled, as I have traveled around this synod, I have heard stories of people who have been to prison, who visit prisons, who are the families of victims, who are victims, who have loved ones in prison. I think we're going to prison. When I was, uh, the last time I served in the synod, it was the interim, as it was, it was the interim pastor at St. Timothy Lutheran Church in Sturgis. When that congregation completed its ministry, those generous people gave all their stuff, all their assets to the synod. Um, I think it was Bishop Schleicher set aside $50,000 for prison ministry. That money is still there. It stares me in the face because uh, I have responsibility to those saints. So I think we are going to prison. So with Pastor Sprague's uh, help, we will be holding a summit in the coming year uh, to bring together anybody and everybody that wants to help me learn about what it means to be church in prison. So that is coming. Um, I should also say, as we talk about mission, uh, one of the things we were charged with is to take youth and uh, young people seriously. Uh, in the fall, we received a grant, and we are going to have a worship conference in our synod about how, about the role that children play in worship. So watch for that, too. Sixth, we are a church together. We are a church together. Bishop Eaton says it. You heard it on uh, the video. She said it over and over again. I have learned that bishops are stewards of the unity of the church. Our job is to be the voice and the conscience that, that is the conscience that is mindful that there's a whole church out there. I think one of the most important things that Sarah and David and I are doing this year is what I call knitting the mitten. 
We want to be about, we are out and about, so that we, we have an incarnational God by having one of us in our, uh, in your churches, we're hoping that we enflesh the rest of you. So I like to talk with this beautiful new crozier uh, made for me by Jim, made for us by Jim Pike in, uh, in Gaylord. I like to talk about, have people point to their church on the hand, and then talk about all the churches that surround us because we are held together in the hand of Christ. I see some pictures up there so you can see some of my travels. Uh, so we are knit in the mitten. We have, as Sandy said, we have, we have uh, initiated a deployed staff, so we are only together in Lansing on Wednesdays. So I would like to thank um, the churches that uh, are hosting us, Church of the Sacred in Kalamazoo, uh, Emmanuel of Mount Pleasant, uh, Trinity in Frankfurt, and St. Matthew's in Heron. Um, and, uh, and I am, and the staff are based at St. Stephen's in Lansing. When I started this out, I said I was a professor once, and I learned about office hours. You have to have office hours. And when the students don't come, the office hours get smaller. And so if there's no students, you just quit having them. We are pretty pleased that uh, when we are in places, we have office hours. People come. So thank you for that. Um, this is a change in appro approach, um, and I guess I need to say we need to figure out what this means ab about our capital campaign of a few years ago where we were going to build a center for, for mission and ministry. So I, as I'm in congregations, um, I am asked what is going to happen to that funding, and we need to figure that out. So that is on uh, both mine and the city council's plate to take a look at. Uh, and what does this mean for synodical committees? Uh, we have a structure that uh, reflects the former church, and um, what does it mean both in the way we structure and how we function as committees? Several people have said to me, don't ask us to drive two hours for a one-hour meeting. Seems fair to me, right? So how do we do that? How do we do that? Uh, the fact that we are a church together means that there needs to be consistency and collaboration across the synod and the church. I just read an article reminding us that the time for Lone Rangers and cowboy diplomacy has passed. The question we need to ask at every level is, how can we cooperate? How can we do things together? And the question I need to ask at every level as I make decisions, and as you ask me to make decisions, is how does this impact the rest of the church? So I, because if I make a decision in your place, I know it's going to affect people over here. So I take that question very seriously. And finally, seven, uh, this sin truly is a place of promise. I have been living with a verse from Jeremiah for a year. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. As I was elected a year ago, as 13 new bishops were elected, as Liz Eaton was elected, we became convinced that God's mischievous spirit is acting in new ways to fulfill old promises across this synod and across the church. So I dare you to embrace the promise. I dare you to share stories of where you see God fulfilling promises. A year ago, I was getting ready for commencement, planning an exit strategy. <laughs> We decided that we would not tell anyone at the school that I was coming here, and that during the commencement Eucharist, I would slip out at the piece into the car that Kathy would have running. <laughs> that nothing would come of this, so that I would be back in class Wednesday morning to begin a one-week intensive. Right? All the while, in the back of my head, I wondered, is God calling me home? Is God bringing me home? 
This is all Bob Lindstrom's fault. <laughs> because as we got to the speeches, Bob was sitting about there and said, Craig, can you see my hand? And I said, Bob, I can't see you. <laughs> so he said, I will, I will say the numbers. It was a foretaste of you whispering in my ear. I continue to whisper. And the speech read, and so I believe I am called to be your bishop. And we got to, what was it, five minutes? Okay. Five minutes, and it came out of my mouth, I am called to be your bishop. I am. Thank you for the honor and privilege of serving the service. Okay, is there a motion to accept the bishop's award? Oh, that's a motion. 